Firstly, just to apologise, never done this before. The recording is absolutely terrible, robotic as hell. I'm reading a script I got ChatGPT to print out because, let's face it, I've never done this before, but it doesn't change the results. Hope you get something from the video. Um, let me know. I'm going to walk you through an audio forensic analysis of the Charlie Kirk shooting. What you're about to see is based entirely on publicly available recordings. Uh, by lining up the different microphones, measuring the delays and tracing the reflections, we can reconstruct the, where the shot came from. The method I'm using is called T Time Difference of Arrival, or TDOA. It is a technique that relies on microsecond level precision in audio and even compressed audio uh, recordings like YouTube or Facebook keep that timing accurate. The key idea is if the impact happens before the bang, the round must be supersonic. The, gra the gap between the impact and the bang tells us the distance. Um, the way the echoes arrive at the different microphones tells us the direction. When you put those pieces together, distance, direction and reflections, the geometry reveals the truth. The shot could not have come from the Losi Centre. Instead, the evidence points cons consistently to a courtyard corner much closer in the 50 to 95 metre range. So let's step through the data, uh, mic by mic, and see how the sound itself makes this case. To do this analysis, I've pulled together audio from multiple cameras that were recording during the event. Now these weren't professional microphones, they were phones and live stream cameras uploaded to YouTube and Facebook. That means the audio is compressed, usually AAC or MP3. But here's the important part. Compression changes frequency detail, not timing. The timestamps of sharp sounds like gunshot cracks are still precise to within microseconds. So even though the recordings aren't lossless, the timing is reliable enough for forensic analysis. The cameras were placed at different points around the courtyard. One at about seven meters to the right, another 12 meters to the front right, one on the left to about 15 meters I measured, um, another one on the back left ledge about 40 meters away, and finally one, uh, uh, one at the front, about 45 meters away. Together these microphones create a network. By comparing what each one hears, the direct shot and then the reflections, we can triangulate both distance and direction. One of the most important clues in the audio is the gap between the bullet hitting and the bang of the rifle reaching the microphones. In the recordings we can clearly see the impact happened before the bang. That only makes sense if the bullet was supersonic, faster than the speed of sound. If it had been subsonic, the bang would have arrived before. So how far, how far away was the shooter? The key timing is the difference. Between the impact of the bang, we measured a gap of about 80 to 160 milliseconds. And that was to include the body reaction time of 120 milliseconds to 200 milliseconds, which is in the paper. That's less than a fifth of a second. Um, but at, that, at, but at these speeds, it's enough to work with. The temperature of that day, um, speed of sound was about 349 meters per second. The rifle round would have been traveling about 820 to 900 meters per second. If you run those numbers, the gap lines up with a shooter between 50 and 90, 95 meters away. If the shoot had been on the Losi building, 130 metres away, the gap would have been more than 214 milliseconds, well outside what we actually measured. So just from this first step, before we even look at reflections or angles, we already know that the shooter was a lot closer, within 100 metres, not 130. Next, let's look at the reflections, the echoes that arrive after the first crack. In a space like this courtyard, sound doesn't just travel in a straight line. It bounces off nearby walls and corners. And each bounce adds a short delay. Those delays show up clearly in the audio as extra peaks after the initial shot. By measuring those delays, we can link them to physical surfaces. For example, on the 7 meter mic, uh, the first reflection appeared about 216 milliseconds after the shot. 
that is an extra path of roughly 75 meters which lines up with the courtyard walls later reflections um, beyond 500 milliseconds correspond with surfaces like the Losi building itself um, but they arrive much too late to be the source um, and the same pattern shows up across all microphones now, the strongest earliest reflections are from walls inside the courtyard, the zone facade, for example, the amphitheatre itself will reflect, um, but that's only 30 metres, so we have a couple of them reflections recorded. And the corner structures, um, we have the square structures in the courtyard, they will reflect sound as well. Um, the loci only appears much later, acting as a distant reflector. So the reflections back up what the impact bang timing already told us. The shot came from within about 100 metres inside the courtyard sector, not from the low seat rooftop. Now let's move to time difference of arrival, or TDOA, which is all about direction. The idea is simple. If two microphones are set apart on a baseline, the shot would sound would reach one of them slightly earlier than the other. The size of that delay tells us the angle the sound came from. With the 15 metre left and the 12 metre right microphones, we measured a small lead on the left side. When you convert that to timing difference, uh, when you convert that timing difference, it points to the sound back across the courtyard towards the south corner. Then using the longer baseline of 40 metres left and 45 metres front right microphone, we saw the same thing. The sound reached one microphone, uh, fraction of a millisecond earlier and that translated to another angle pointing to the same sector. When you extend both of these corridors backwards they intersect right into the courtyard corner. That is the power of TDOA. Two independent microphone pairs both point into the same zone and it's not just approximate. The math here is precise to a few degrees. Both baselines converge on the same corner and that is exactly where the reflections are coming from too. All that's left now is to bring it together. The first impact bang timing gave us the range. The gap we measured 80 to 160 milliseconds, put the shooter between 50 and 95 meters. Now let's bring everything together. First, the impact bang timing gave us a range. The gap we measured was 80 to 160 milliseconds, put the shooter between 50 and 95 meters away. That rules out the low sea building at 130 metres away because the delay would have been far longer. Second, the reflections all lined up with the nearby courtyard walls and corners and the first echoes came from surfaces within 40 to 80 metres. While the low sea building only appeared much later as a distant bounce, that tells us the sound field was contained inside the courtyard. Third, the TDOA baseline gives us direction. Um, both the short 22 metre baseline and the long 75 metre baseline pointed back to the same sector, south courtyard corner. When you overlay those three methods, range from timing, angles from TDOA and surfaces from reflections, they all intersect in the same place. The conclusion is unavoidable. The shooter was not on the low sea centre. All of the independent evidence, timing, echoes and geometry converge on the south corner of the courtyard within 100 metres of Charlie Kirk. More specifically, I would assume more like 50 metres, 60 metres, only because if you go out to 90 metres, 95 metres, you're standing on the grass and you can't get the angle for the shot. So I measured 82 milliseconds. Um, everybody can go nuts, measure it themselves, impact minus the body reaction time um, to get the actual impact time and then obviously work out their own version of this but um, it won't change the conclusion, it just the, the results won't change and if they do it will be about three metres um, overall so I mean you're not going to change the result. So that is my analysis, I encourage anyone who wants to to go measure it for themselves all I've done here is approach it from an audio engineer's perspective. Uh, sound is what I'm trained in. Uh, I can't speak to gun types, bullet types, calibers, anything outside of the audio. But what I can say with confidence is, confidence is the audio doesn't bend narrative. To back this up, I also work with ChatGPT to write a full essay that lays out the physics behind the conclusion. It's not wrong. It frames the results in a more academic way. One final note. I apologise if this feels a bit robotic, I'm not a YouTuber 
um, and I'm not used to being in front of a camera. That said, if people find this useful and want me to analyze more cases like this, I'd be happy to invest more time into it. Uh, and the setup perhaps, and perhaps even the video could probably, you know, do with the <laughs> and step up the production side of things. Well, I appreciate your time. Um, the essay itself can be found in the description. Feel free to leave comments and stuff. Uh, any questions, whatever, um, let us know. Happy to answer them as best as I can. Cheers.